It is my great honor and privilege this morning to be able to introduce to you my husband. Yes. For many years, Wes has been preaching and understanding aspects of the kingdom. And as as I've seen these messages, feel free to take a seat. As I've seen these messages come out of him, I began to understand that even his upbringing, being the youngest of ten, how God used it to give him an understanding of family, an understanding of kingdom, of an understanding of shared inheritance, and, and how God had placed him in this family and then downloaded understanding that that was coming out before I was hearing it, even in other places. Then I had the privilege of standing beside him and, and watching him minister in Germany. Wesley's great-great-grandmother, I think it is, a German Jew. And we were ministering in Germany, and partway through the message, the, the senior pastor, a German, in, in that congregation, he stood and he was interpreting for Wes. And at one stage there, he stood with his arm around Wes and both of these men, one whose inheritance was a German Jew and the other a German, stood and they preached about the kingdom of God. They preached about reconciliation. They, checked, they preached about shared inheritance and kingdom principles. And I sat there and I wept. And so it is an honor to be able to stand alongside you. It's an honor to be able to, to witness and see what God has been doing in your life and how he pours through you. And I honor you as an apostle in this nation. I see how you carry this nation in your heart. I see how you champion the prophets in this nation. I see how you carry the young men and the cultures in this nation. And I honor you for an, as an apostle in this nation. And we welcome you. Well, Jesus is good. <laughs> you may be seated. So thank, thank you, jo darling. Thank you so much for those beautiful words. If we ever have a tiff, I'll remind you of them. And <laughs> I'll, tra I'll transcribe the recording and just get you to sign it. And <laughs> Not trying to make light of it, light of it, but um, it, it's it's humbling. It's very humbling. And uh, on good days, you know, when you, as a leader, and you, you have great days, and uh, and then you, and you can have ch really challenging days. And on the challenging days, uh, the enemy always tries to, get, well, often tries to get you to compare yourself with somebody really great. And uh, when you, you, you turned sixty late last year, and and and, he, and you know the stuff tries to swirl around your head. What have you really done? What have what what mark are you really leaving? What 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 you know? And and he always, for me anyway. Sometimes you'll try and attack your mind by trying to get you to compare yourself with somebody great to make yourself look very small, very insignificant. You've done nothing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's just typical enemy attack, right? That's just, that's just that's enemy attack. Why doesn't he get you to? Why doesn't he get you to compare yourself with a couch spud <laughs> who's just watched soap operas all their life and drunk copious amounts of co coke and eaten truckloads of Chips. <laughs> why doesn't he get? Why doesn't he get you to compare yourself with that person? Because there's no condemnation in it. He'll only get you to compare yourself with somebody where condemnation can take root. So you know that, that's just how it is, isn't it? You know, it's just how it is. So uh, I, I, I have the privilege. Th thank you for staying. <laughs> I really mean that. You know. <laughs> Because when, when you're hosting a conference and you're speaking in a conference that you're hosting yourself, it's kind of like, will anybody stay, you know? I know some, the camera people will because, you know, and the musicians will. And, and you know what I mean, Ian? I, I don't know if you've ever thought that. Uh, you know, yeah. 
And then, of course, in your own self, you've got to put, a, put away false humility. You've got, to, you've got to do that. And you've got to step up. And uh, you've, got to, you've got to share what's in your heart. And, and uh, uh, I, I can I really identify with Norm because uh, I, you know, grew up the youngest of 10, uh, dyslexia. You know, I didn't know what that was back in those days. You just thought you, you, just thought you were thick. And, uh, but I was, I was good with my hands. And I figured out one day, actually, uh, it's my brain that controls my hands. Because my brains, my hands just don't do things on their own, you know. <laughs> Maybe yours do, but mine don't. And and I realised that actually my hands are connected to my brain, and if I can do good things with my hands, then I've actually got a good brain. Yeah. Isn't that right, Mel? Marion. Yeah. And so you gotta, you, you got to shove off that stuff. you got to shove off the old labels, the old self-judgments, the old concepts of yourself to be able to step in and actually take ownership of what God is actually speaking into you and calling you to and so on and so forth. That's part of the journey uh, for people who had deep roots of insecurity, which is quite a lot of us, right? Quite a lot of us. And so I want to share some things this morning in relation to uh, my iPads doing, not turning like that, so there we are. Now, when I turn it that way, it'll probably go the other way, you know. And I do need my glasses. My expensive ones, these are the $29 ones from uh, the, the uh, pharmacy. They're not the $5 cheap ones. <laughs> the little cheap ones come with your own case, and the only good thing about them is the case. You know. And those who have bought cheap reading glasses to leave, every, leave everywhere, so you, can, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know. But there's, we've, we've stepped into a new era. We really have. That wasn't just a, a, a concept idea to name a conference to catch people's attention. That wasn't the purpose at all. We deliberately named the conference this because we sincerely believe, prophetically, that we have actually come into another era. And there are, there are things that are, that, that are going to transition for a long time because there's always early adopters, mid-adopters, and those who didn't know what happened. You hear what I'm saying? We had a move in the 90s. I didn't hear about that. You hear you know what I'm saying, don't you? And, and there were those, though, who caught it real quick and then those who, but later on. And so... There, there, there's a new, we've entered, a new, we've entered another era. We've entered a new era. And there's been various things declared about that. But one of, the, one of the key things I believe that is going to really unfold in an accelerated manner in this time we're in now is the whole dimension of apostolic fathering and what it is for the house of God to be shaped according to the nature and the spirit of the Father that we see mentioned or spoken of so beautifully in Luke chapter 15. And I'm not going to preach out of Luke chapter 15 before. Some of you will have heard me preach out of that many times, out of the whole story of the two sons, one that was, the two that were lost, actually. Both of them were lost. And so, but we're not going to go there. But I, uh, that's, been, that's been a key passage for me uh, for so long now, for years now, uh, meditating and pondering and exploring, asking people, what does this mean? talking to people who might have cultural understanding of the times that Jesus was speaking into and getting the, getting the nuances, the, the understandings culturally of what it was about the father, what it was about that son that went away, what it was about the inheritance he asked for, what it was about the older brother, what it was, all, all, all the dimensions I can possibly find out about. I'm co I've come to this position. I'm absolutely convinced that the, the nature of the Father's house is to be seen in the house of God. It's not to be a house of legalism. It's not to be a house of condemnation. It's not to be a house of performance orientation. It's not to be a house that's just trying to keep up an image. It's not to be a corporation where all we're worried about ultimately, really, secretly, is the black numbers on the bottom lining of the accounting sheet. It's not to be any of that. It's actually to be a very powerful family with the Spirit of the Father 
and all of that manifests out of the Father's heart that we see described in that amazing story. Billy Graham said the most important story in the New Testament outside of the crucifixion, resurrection, and the cross of Christ. That was Billy Graham's opinion. I respect his opinion. You know what I'm saying? And so for a long time now, I've been in this journey of, of endeavoring to discover what, what, does the, what, does the, what is the spirit that God wants in his house? What, what, is, what, what is he wanting to create on earth where in our gatherings, in our, in our connections, in our relationships, people who are lost and broken, despondent, whatever it is, bound in darkness, come into that situation or somehow find their way or God draws them in. I'm not talking about the, the goings out that we do because that's totally important and that's, that's, that's awesome and, and we've got to be doing that. What I'm saying though is, when the saints get together, what atmosphere and what spirit is the prevailing spirit? What spirit meets a person as, they, as they're walking in the driveway? What spirit meets them as they're walking up the pathway? What spirit meets a person that emanates out of the greeters on the door? What spirit emanates out of the people that are in the worship team? And, and, and leading us in worship. What spirit emanates out of those who are handling this dimension and that dimension that all are necessary for the, for the coming together of this, this organization, this family, which is an expression of the local church on earth, which is to carry a spirit. What, I, I've studied toxic environments, not as a major in a university situation, but I've just been through various and into various situations through the years, as you do, and just experienced and observed and watched, and then over time you get to observe the fruit that it produces. I've come to see this, that toxic environments produce death. Toxic attitudes in the leadership will eventually produce death. Toxic attitudes in the servants of the house will eventually produce death. But I want to tell you the spirit of the Father, the spirit of mercy, the spirit of compassion, the spirit of love that's in the heart of the people, that's genuine and authentic, it'll produce life. It'll actually emanate, it'll, it'll create a sphere of influence that'll actually meet people who are coming into that sphere. They start to experience things they've never felt before. They start to feel things they've never felt before. It undoes, it undoes them in the sense of the defenses and suddenly they're experiencing something of God which, which just starts to melt their hearts. Just starts to melt the hardness, melt the brokenness, melt, melt the despair, melt the hopelessness. I want to tell you, that is an absolute joy when I hear people tell me that that's what they experienced when they walked up the path. It's a joy to me when I hear people say to me, and they've, they've been here maybe a couple of weeks or whatever, wherever it is, and they say, I feel like I've come home. Now, in your assemblies, you will also have people say to you, I feel like I've come home. That is a very powerful indicator of the health of what's actually happening in that house. When people say to you, I feel like I've come home, what's happened? Their spirit has been looking for something. They may not have been able to put it into words. They may not have been able to articulate it. But when they walk into your environment, they work at, walk into your sphere, suddenly something is happening to them and they feel like they've come home. I might have tell you, my friends, take that as an encouragement because it's an indication of the kind of spirit that's around what you're doing. I've also seen some really toxic environments where, where there's been contention, jealousy, uh, uh, distrust, uh, 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 division, uh, division of vision, division, uh, and, and, the, and sarcasm, and, and putting people down, praising them to their face, but mocking them behind their backs. I've seen that. I've seen the manifest, I've seen what that causes. And I made up my mind a long time ago that we really need to build something that's not like that. It wasn't a, it wasn't a judgment in the sense of judging those people. It was more like a saying, the life of God is better than that. The life of God will produce life. The life of God will produce hope. It'll, produce, it'll disarm people whereby the Spirit of God and the Word of God can get in and, and, and transformation can take place. 
But as soon as we've produced an environment that needs people to perform to fit a culture or to, or to perform to produce a standard or an image, we're losing the battle because what's really happening is a lot of facades are being built, a lot of walls are being built, and the real self is never able to be exposed in a place of safety. So I'm, I'm really passionate about, about the, the whole idea or the whole concept of welcoming the, whole, welcoming the Holy Spirit, welcoming Him as Word, but, but building convictions or having convictions built that really underlie a genuine, authentic sense of family. Now, we know that we know that there has been a, a significant move in terms of the whole corporate idea of church. There's often been strong leadership. There's often been strong structures. There's often been very tight timetables. There's been very, very strong uh, image of what needs to be presented. And some of those things, some of those organized uh, groups have produced some pretty powerful growth. I want to tell you this. I'm not, I'm not knocking that in that sense. But what I am saying is this. Family needs structure. But fundamentally, it's got to be family. Now, I'm not talking about mum, dad, three children. I'm talking about a family of God attitude, family of God convictions, family of God val- values that don't, that, that's not about color of skin. It's not about, it's not about ethnic background. It's not about, it's not about, it's not about, uh, uh, socioeconomic levels, it's not about education levels, it's about a fundamental value that we have for each other that is so much deeper than any of that. It's not based on sentimentality, because sentimentality can come and go like the wind. I, I used to get tears in my eyes watching Lassie. You did too. Hands up all those who got tears in my watching Lassie. I'm at home. <laughs> I'm at home. I found family. You know, <laughs> mum used to say there was a river behind my eyes. Because my emotions would be v- touched very easily. And when the Holy Ghost comes on me, oftentimes, I mean, people laugh, shake, rattle, roll, get stuck to the tent roof, whatever. I cry. <laughs> I, just, I just cry, I weep. And people, oh, there's something wrong. There's something wrong with you. It's sad about I'm not sad. I'm happy. I'm crying. <laughs> Gratitude and the, his kindness and his mercy and, and his goodness and his love and his patience. And you're just weeping, you know. That's what happens to me. <laughs> uh, if you ever see me buckled over like this and I'm going like this, it's not because I'm sad or, or hurt or grieving. It's because I'm just, it's just, I'm just, it's just, God is so amazing. He's just so kind. He's just been very kind to this boy. <laughs> so let's get into it. That's to try and lay our foundation. The last, we know that the last verse is in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, in Malachi. Malachi chapter 4, four verse 5 to 6. Behold, I send to you Elijah, the prophet before the great, and terrible day of the, the, of the Lord comes. We could debate about what the great and terrible day looks like. We could, we could get into that, but that's not what we're doing. And he shall turn and reconcile, this amplified version, he shall turn and reconcile the hearts of the estranged fathers to the ungodly children and the hearts of rebellious children to the piety, which is the godliness, of their fathers. A... A reconciliation produced by repentance of the ungodly. Lest I come and smite the land. We've been talking about the land a lot. Lest I come and smite the land with a curse and a ban of utter destruction. Pretty heavy duty. But how many know that in our society, fatherlessness, uh, fathers that abandon their post, fathers that never understood their responsibility, who might abuse and neglect and abandon and so on and so forth or live a lifestyle that damages their children. How many many know that produces a lot of damage? How many of us in counseling situations or ministry situations eventually get to a person in a person's life, a situation in a person's life where it comes down to really what they're carrying still in relation to their dad, in relation to their mum, 
it just goes on and on and on. So in that whole culture of abuse and and fatherlessness and abandonment and all that sort of thing, basically it just carries its own judgment. Now what I mean by judgment, it just carries its own outworking of damage. And so God's heart is, and it's always been, to see fathering rise. And when I say fathering, please hear me. I'm, I'm, it's fathering and mothering. It's the whole, that whole loving parenting dimension which first comes from the Father and it manifests in men and women in such a way that it secures, it, it releases identity, it celebrates, it, it raises up, it encourages, it builds places of safety and hope and where the person feels safe and secure to explore the world. Not the world system, but the world that God created. And so... We, we, it's always God's heart. And so before John the Baptist came, he was, as Jesus said, moving, or he was Elijah in that sense. He said, if you can handle this, Elijah's already come. Because the Jews knew that Elijah was to come. Even at the Passover, they still have a chair uh, set in the Passover feast, the chair for Elijah, because they still believe Elijah will come. And at the end of the Passover feast, Elijah hasn't come and sat in the chair. You know what I'm saying? And they'll say at the end of the feast, next year in Jerusalem. And so, so we know that there's anticipation that Elijah will come in the mind of the Jew who hasn't yet received Yeshua as Messiah. But here's the deal. Elijah has come. And Jesus said Elijah has come. And the ministry and the spirit of John the Baptist, what did John the Baptist do? He preached a message of repentance. He was the voice in the wilderness. Uh, make straight the way of the Lord, prophesied in Isaiah. And John the Baptist steps in, carries that mantle, carries that spirit. And the repentance, the message of repentance swept Israel. They were baptized as a sign of their repentance, the baptism of John. And so in that repentance, there would have been a lot of families restored. I'll tell you why. Because the spirit of Elijah causes fathers to come in connection with their responsibility for fathering. Causes mother, mothers to step up in the spirit of mothering, the mothering father dimension. It causes sons and daughters who have been rebellious for whatever reason to turn and receive a spirit of sonship and daughtership and to return to their fathers and their mothers and build a connection again, a healing, a connection again where inheritance can flow from one generation to another because the kingdom is about inheritance flowing from generation to generation to generation and building with every transfer. That's why Jesus said, anybody believes on me, these things shall he do, but even greater things shall he do. Why? Because there's a multiplying, increasing inheritance. We see the breakdown of it between, with, from Elijah to Elisha, we see, that, we see the transfer of that anointing. We see that Elisha went after it. Elijah was in his journey. People can interpret it all sorts of ways, but we see Elisha going after it. He valued it. He, it was precious. It was, had to be gotten a hold of. And eventually when Elisha was taken up, he received that mantle and then he began to do the works of the miraculous. But then we have a situation between Elisha and Gehazi. Gehazi was Elisha's servant. We don't read about anybody being thrown into a hole where Elijah is. We read about a story where me, but people are thrown in where Elisha is and the anointing's still in his bones. Some people celebrate that. Even Elisha's bones were anointed and somebody raised from the dead. I, my question is this, and it may be a legal question, it may not. Give me latitude for being a Westerner. And, 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 but what, were the, what was the anointing still doing in the bones? It was meant for, Eli, it was meant for Gehazi. That's how I read it. It was meant for Gehazi. Gehazi could have taken it. Gehazi could have stepped into it. It could have doubled again. But at the, at the healing of Naaman, when Naaman the Syrian came through that little servant girl who had been taken captive and didn't succumb to her self-pity, didn't come to her, her want of revenge, 
but said if, if my master would go to Israel and there's a prophet in Israel, he would be healed. The power of a little person with a word of faith. Her name's not even mentioned. So I don't think you have to have a name that the world knows to initiate something that ends in a great miracle. Hear what I'm saying? In fact, often the people with a great name have to somehow keep up the act. But if not a genuine, authentic thing, it kills them. But the little girl, and so Naaman went. We know the story. He washed in the Jordan seven times after a bit of a protest. And he was so grateful, his skin was washed clean, he was cleansed. He went and he wanted to give a gift to Elisha. And Elisha, clothing and gold and silver, all that stuff that he came from Syria with, well, wonderful stuff, no doubt, but who knows what demons were in the garments? Who knows? I don't know. And uh, Elisha turns them away, but Gehazi goes after it. He covets it, and he lies. Lying to a prophet like that, The leprosy that was on him will now be on you. That anointing went to the grave. This is my interpretation of it. So it could have gone Elijah, Elisha double, Gehazi double. Gehazi could have had a servant. It could have doubled again. Could have doubled again. Jesus said, anybody who believes on me, as the scripture has said, there's an inheritance issue. There's an inheritance issue. Bill Johnson's onto it. Many people are onto it. Our, ce our ceiling is to be their floor. Our shoulders is to be what they stand on. Why? Because there's an inheritance that goes from fathers, mothers to sons, daughters. And it takes the spirit of parenthood, the spirit of fathering, mothering, to be wanting to release that inheritance into those who have the spirit of sonship and the spirit of daughterhood. And I'm saying that because I don't want to be accused of being sexist. You know what I'm saying, don't you? I could just say fathers and sons, and we all just say we're all included in that, but I have to, I have to say that just to, just to stop the confusion that some people get into. And so... The, the reason Elijah came, sorry, the reason the spirit of Elijah was on John the Baptist was to, to bring a, a, a move of repentance in Israel where sons and daughters were restored to fathers and mothers and fathers and mothers were restored to children. Why? Because it prepared the way of the Lord. I'm convinced of this that the Spirit of God is releasing a, a, the, a, the aposto, an apostolic dimension called fathering and mothering, which is going to rise in the house so those who are receiving the spirit of sonship and daughtership can actually connect with fathers and mothers and there can be a tr eventual a transference of inheritance whereby the, dimension of the of dimensions of the kingdom increase rather than diminish. The devil has tried to get us into, into division. He's tried to get us into generationalism and generational prejudice, whether it's from older people toward young or younger people toward older, and break down the process of the transfer of inheritance. As leaders... We need to be partnering with heaven and seeing an environment built where sons and daughters connect with mothers and fathers and there's a raising up, there's a believing in, there's a celebrating in and those sons and daughters feel safe, they feel secure, they feel believed in. If they trip over and mess up, they've got a home to go to that's not gonna throw them out under the bus and they've got a fixed up, repaired up, believed in again and sent again. I tell you, that's what God's building. It's an apostolic dimension. And it's what I'm absolutely convinced about. Absolutely convinced about. But it can't be built on sentimentality. Sentimentality comes and goes like the wind. 
got to be built out of conviction of revelation. Revelation is your power base. Where you have revelation, you have power. On this rock, I will build my church. What? The revelation that Christ is the, the Son of God. That Jesus, the Son of God, is the Christ. Revelation, power. Wherever you have revelation from the Father, through the Holy Ghost, by the Word, you will have power in that area. So this has got to be revelation. It's got to be, and revelation becomes conviction. Conviction becomes our values. They're non-negotiable values. We're not going to argue about them. We're not going to bother debating them. They're our values. It's a done deal. That's it. We're not going to waste our time debating them. We'll share the ideas, but you're not going to talk us out of them because the convictions based in revelation that have produced our values, then those values produce what we do. We can't say we've got a value in something when we don't actually do it. It's just an idea. You hear what I'm saying? And so the fundamental dimensions or fundamental attitudes of what it is to be family of God go right back into the absolute roots of redemption itself. Not based on sentimentality. Not based on whether that person seems nice to you or not. That's totally immaterial. In fact, Jesus said it this way. If you love the ones that just invite you back after you've invited them, what big deal. The, the, the pagans do that. The, the, the unbelievers do that. When you hold a feast, invite those who can't invite you back. It's not sentimentality. So in Psalm 68 verse 5, we see this amazing passage that reveals the heart of the Father. Psalm 68 verse 5 says, A father, he is a father to the father, a father to the fatherless, a defender of, defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God, is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dry, dwell in a dry land. Let me ask you this. Where is God's dwelling place on earth? Very simple answer. Thank you, Ken. You got it right. Point it to yourself. Who is God's dwelling place on earth? You are. You are individually. Paul says, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> We're one spirit with him. We're temples of the Holy Spirit. A temple in, the, in that kind of God's dwelling place. We are also being built together as living stones into a house corporately where God occupies by his presence. So we're both individually his house, but we're corporately his house. We are his dwelling place. It's not illegal to say that. Do you think it's, wave your hand if you think it's illegal to say that. It's not illegal to say that. Out of our innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Who is the living water? He's the Holy Spirit. He's God himself. We are full, filled in Christ with all his fullness. Is fundamental. So we are God's dwelling place on earth. Point to somebody and say, you're part of God. You're God's dwelling place on earth. You're God's dwelling place on earth. You're God. God lives in your street. God lives at your address. You can't leave His presence. We say we come into His presence in terms of a sense of His manifest, revealed, experiential presence, but you cannot leave His presence. He goes with you. He's with Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will, come, I, I will be with you right to the end of the age, and we're not at the end of the age yet. And at the end of the age, according to my understanding of the reading of the Scriptures, we're going to get resurrected or transformed, depending on whether you're still alive. And so we are God's dwelling place on earth. Who is God in his dwelling place? 
a father to the fatherless, and a defender of widows. It would seem very natural to me that if in the gathering of the saints, it would seem very strange if there was not a spirit amongst us that was a fathering spirit to the orphans. It would seem very strange to me if there is not an attitude toward the widows which is one of protection and gathering and valuing. It would be strange. You would have to say God doesn't live there because where God dwells, he's a father to the fatherless and he's a defender of widows. This is why he was... This is why Jesus was so opposed to prejudice uh, against the wealthy and the poor. And he rebuked them. He said, a guy comes in in flash clothes, and you say, oh, sit here, sit here. Guy comes in in ragged clothes, and you, oh, go down the back. It's, it's revealing the prejudice. And the prejudice is based on a lack of revelation about the value of every human being that's come to Christ. And the fact, whether you understand that brother or not, whether you think it's a, he's a bit weird or she's a bit weird, whatever, fundamentally, even though there's still a journey for that person, they are highly valuable, they are lo- beloved by the Father, and uh, they, they are a dwelling place of God Himself. Wow. See, these things are fundamental to the way we view each other. If I see you in your sin, and I'm always evaluating you in your sin or your mistakes or your failures, I will, I will generate, I will have a critical spirit because fundamentally I'm not at peace with God myself. Romans 5 and 6. But if I'm at peace with God and I know that Jesus is the atonement for me and I've been purchased by His blood and I've been reconciled into Him and I'm in Christ and His righteousness has been imputed and imparted into me, I'm a new creation with a new nature and I see myself that way. I know I have access to the inheritance by faith and the riches of God by faith and it's, that, and, and it's by that faith that I stand secure in that place of receiving and that place of access to the heavenly treasures. And if I see myself that way, therefore it's natural that I would see other saints that way as well. So how you see yourself will be how you see the brethren around you. If you see yourself as a failure, if you see yourself as a sinner saved by grace only, if you see yourself as somebody who's never quite measuring up and never really measuring up, then it's going to be easy to judge other people as never really measuring up as well. And you'll be focused on the sin of people rather than on the righteousness. Because fundamentally, we're not at peace with God. If you're at peace with God yourself and you know it and it's settled and you're secure in that and you rejoice in His goodness and His kindness, you will just naturally act that way to another believer. There might be some attitudes and some practice things they're doing in their life that maybe you need to chat with them about, but you're chatting them from, you're talking to them in order to call them up into their right, right and up into their sonship, not to somehow qualify for sonship. This is a fundamental attitude that needs to go deeper and deeper in us so that we have the foundation that produces the conviction that lead to the values of how we operate with each other. This will set the tone of the house. This will set the tone of the house. Who is God in his holy habitation? Defender of father to the fatherless, defender of widows. I'm convinced of this, that this some of these things are going to unfold so rapidly in this era now, it's actually going to transfer, it's going to transform the tone of the nature of the house up and down this nation. Leaders will act differently toward the people. 
They won't see the people as a commodity from which they extract energy and funds. But they'll see them as precious beloved of the Lord who are to be nurtured, believed in, equipped, valued, and befriended. It'll break down this ridiculous professionalism that means that the clergy, we, we have annihilated that term clergy and laity a long time ago. Don't believe in it. Unbiblical. There's no such thing as a professional clergy. No such thing as a laity. Laity means uneducated. There are saints bought by the blood of Jesus who've who've been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. Sure, we may have different understandings. Sure, some of us may not know how to read and write. Sure, but as we know, God uses, moves powerfully through people and it's not about their education, it's about their faith and their trust and their yieldedness. Am I opposed to education? Not at all. But I am opposed to the kind of education that leads to unbelief and ungodliness. Why would you bother? (laughs) Right, Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, 14. I'm talking about the fundamental convictions of why we're family. For this reason I bow my knees. This, This is... The apostle, by the Holy Ghost, inspired by the Holy Ghost, saying this, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family and heaven and earth is named. We've got the same surname because we've got the same dad. We've got the same father. There's there's two families on the earth. The family that is still in the first Adam with the inheritance that goes with that, it's not a pretty picture. And and those who have been born again through in the last Adam, Christ, of whom the first Adam was a picture of. Through one man, death came to, gift came to, and corruption came to creation. But through one man's righteousness, life has come to many more. Life from the dead. And so if you're in Christ, you're alive from the dead already. Your body may die, but the resurrection is guaranteed. Because you're in Christ. How did I get out there? Don't know. (laughs) From whom the whole family... And heaven and earth is named. I'm, as Janet said, I'm the youngest of 10 children. My parents weren't Roman Catholic. <laughs> but they didn't have a TV. That's Dad's story. <laughs> Dad said that. I don't, I don't care. Why our populations, our, our, our reproductive population is shrinking is too many iPhones, too many TVs, and too much Netflix. I'm actually quite serious. It's an enemy to your marital intimacy. It's got to be managed. How did I get out there? That was a long dark night. For this reason, I bow my knee. (laughs) No TV, 10 kids, not Roman Catholic. That's right, youngest of 10, that's right. (laughs) Go back to the root, you know. Uh, Youngest of 10. So, uh, quoting Norman. And uh, uh, 1797, something like that. And uh, so, youngest of 10 by four years. So, don't tell me that you're still upset because you weren't planned. I wasn't planned. The last six of us were not planned. (laughs) 
Oh, they tried family planning. (laughs) But I came to see in the Scriptures that I wasn't born by the will of man. Or the will of a husband. So just, I'm, I'm sorry, but if you've been a long time in that whole depression thing about not being planned, please get out of it. Don't stay focused on that. Focus on the fact that your heavenly Father planned you. He planned you and desired you so much that He sent His Son for you to redeem you out of the bondage of the devil, to take you out of an old kingdom of death and destruction and despair and bring you into the kingdom of the Son of His love. That's what He did. You were born by the will of the Father. The heavenly father. You've never been fatherless. You hear what I'm saying? We may not have had one with skin on that we could relate to, but ultimately you've never been fatherless. Because even before, the, before he time began, before he created the world, he already knew your name. And when somebody knows your name and are a father, it's because they have something to do with your life. Fathers bring people into the world with a name. Mothers bring people into the world with a name because they have purpose. They were known before the beginning of time. Never say you're purposeless. Never say you're valueless. Never say you're just an accident. That is far as far from the truth as the East is from the West. It's a lie. Lies have power when we believe them because we think they're true but I'm exposing a lie. You were born by the will of the Father and so was I. So if you were born by the will of the Father and I was born by the will of the Father, the person sitting next to you was born by the will of the Father. The person sitting next to you, name was known before any tree grew, before even the Holy Ghost brooded over the earth and God spoke. Wow, not only that, but you were predestined unto the awesome things that God had laid up for you to do. I'm talking about the fundamental reasons why we value each other as family. That will actually set the tone of the house. It'll cause us to view each other differently than the way people do in the world. Paul even said, we, we, used, to, we used to judge Christ, we judged Christ after the flesh. We don't do that now. We don't judge anybody after the flesh anymore. But you see, we've been so sin conscious. When we're so sin conscious with ourselves and insecure with God, we're sin conscious with everybody around us. So instead of moving in a spirit of love and generosity and believing in people, it's just a critical spirit. A critical spirit sets the tone of a house. People walk into it, feel it. They don't want to come back. They just go to McDonald's. For all the McDonald's fans. I'm talking about fundamental values. How are we doing for time? Oh, cool. <laughs> love you, Chris. <laughs> See, it's fundamental. That's why Jesus said, if you do it unto the least of these, my brethren, you do it unto me. Because that actually exposes the value system by which we're operating. The ones on the left had a value system that was very different to the ones on the right, or will have. It'll be revealed. The sheep on the right, they didn't even know they'd done that to Jesus. You know, clothing him, feeding him, visiting him in prison. They didn't even know they'd done that to Jesus. But as, as, as the Lord spoke out of heaven to Paul and that uh, Saul on that counter to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The ones on the left, they just didn't do it to anybody. <laughs> Therefore, they didn't do it to Jesus. The ones on the right were doing that for people out of their love. They didn't realize they were doing it to Jesus. I wonder what, when we project forward into that day when, the, when there's the left and the right judgment going on, 
I wonder what the atmosphere of the two sides will feel like. Just thinking. <laughs> Fundamental ideas. Godly fathering, godly mothering secures family. It imparts and calls up identity and into identity. It often believes in a son or a daughter's capacities before they do. How many of us have stepped into something because a father or a mother believed in us? We didn't believe in ourselves. We didn't believe we could do it. We thought we were just underqualified, not qualified at all. But a father or a mother believed in us and gave us the courage to step into it. And we stepped into it. And lo and behold, grace started to flow. Anointing started to flow. And suddenly we're in this place where, oh my goodness, why did I not believe in myself? I remember as a very young guy, uh, young, young believer in the, the New Life Church in Cromwell, Fergus McIntyre, who some of you may remember or may know, he's in Australia, great guy. Uh, he, he was the pastor. He lived in Queenstown at the time. He would come over and, and help us and minister and so on. We're in this meeting. There was only, what, maybe 30 people, uh, maybe 35, something like that, in a school hall. Somebody was on the piano. Nicky Wiltshire, I think, was on the piano. And uh, singing, somebody was worship leading. And, and I, I just felt this thing going on inside me like a song starting to go on inside me like this, and I'm going, oh, didn't I have a, didn't have a clue what to do with it. Didn't, didn't have any, any courage to sing it. Didn't know what to do with it. Just felt this thing going on inside me. I happened to be standing next to Fergus. Fergus put his arm around me and said, you've got a song and you sing it. <laughs> and, and my knees were knocking, and it wasn't the anointing. You know, it was, I was just like this. And I, but, but what helped me cross the line was the fact that my pastor and, and, and becoming at that moment like a father, in, the, in that time was like, he was like a father figure to me, expressed belief. Expressed belief in me. Somehow he picked it up inside me. He was a prophetic guy. He picked it up inside and put his arm around me and said, you've got a song, sing it. So I, this feeling just sort of built up and built up and then I started to sing it. And it, it actually was really nice. Well, actually nice, because people started crying, and it wasn't because they, their ears were hurting or anything. They started crying, and then at the end of it, I was shaking so much, I didn't know what it was, whether it was, I didn't know what it was happening, I was just shaking so much, I had to hang on to the chair, like this, and I was just, oh, I was like this, and then people came up to me and later said, oh, that so blessed me, that so blessed me. That helped me cross the line. I would never have brought that out unless a father had put his arm around me and said, you've got a song, bring it out. That's what fathers and mothers do. Fathers and mothers believe in their sons and daughters before the sons and daughters do. And it's not about age, actually. There's plenty of people in their 50s, 60s, 70s just need somebody to believe in them, to believe in Christ in them, to believe in the Holy Ghost in them, to believe in their experience in life and say, you've got something of treasure, bring it out. Find somewhere respond to that invitation take that invitation let that life that's in you go oh you think I can do it absolutely need we need somebody to believe on us that's got skin on us and get alongside of us we've got a father in heaven who believes in us and he manifests that belief through somebody who can just get along and say go for it you're going to do it it's going to be okay and you get up there and you're, you're fearing and trembling and you and you do it and you've crossed the line you've stepped into another realm <laughs> the spirit of sonship, daughtership also invites correction is open to it the problem with the breakdown and the insecurities is that we take correction as rejection now, sometimes people can deliver it too harshly and it, oh, <laughs> You know, but I'm, I'm generally speaking now, if there's real insecurities there or real pride there, whatever, and somebody does try and correct us to bring an improvement, a growth, uh, an enhancement, uh, uh, wanting to take, help you go into another level, but we take it as rejection, it's just that old thing. It's just that old spirit. It's just that old insecurity speaking. 
And so what it'll do, we just go into the cave of self-pity, rejection, whatever it is. And if it takes root, it can turn to offense and then it can turn to betrayal. All because really, out of you were attempting to do it in love, you tried to bring some correction, but the insecurities there just manifested, reacted, and it just went into this whole cave thing. And as a result, the development of the growth gets thwarted. But the spirit of sonship, the spirit of daughtership really coming on people, I believe is going to cause people to be able to cross that stuff, get out of that stuff. The identity is going to be secure enough where people will actually invite being critiqued. How did I do? How did I do? Because not rejection. In the family of God, the family, genuine family of God attitude is not rejection. It's enhancement. It's helping us grow. And so the whole orphan spirit deal, the whole orphan heart deal, the whole orphan thinking deal is a demonic construct to try and separate us from the growth, the help, the enhancement, the identity, the development that we could have if we were open to genuine fathering and mothering coming into our life. So when we, somebody says something, to, you know, father or mother figure says something to us to try and help us, and we get an immediate reaction, of, they're rejecting me. It's just an old thing. See it as an old thing. It's not actually you. Not the real you. And it's not the real Christ in you. It's an old thing. It's an echo from the past. It's, a, it, it's, it's, an, old, it's an old idea. It's an old thinking system that just got, or it's an old pain that just got some reactivated. Eh, up it flared. Uh. So, moving along. See, in a, in a healthy fathering, mothering situation, where there's a belief in that person's identity in Christ and, a, and, and, and a looking for the continued maturity that goes on. Because you don't give a three-year-old a chainsaw. Not one that's going anyway. <laughs> you can take the spark plug out and give it to him. Going to be no problem probably. Maybe take the chain off as well but you don't give an operational train sort to a three-year-old. You hear what I'm saying? So there is a maturity issue that goes on in the family of God. We know what people are ready for. When my, when my brother's child was nine months old, the little guy was walking. <laughs> nine months old. He climbed into a gas oven. Didn't get hurt, didn't get hurt, but he, he was only nine or ten months old, living in a caravan in Australia just for a while while we were on a bit of a work thing over there. And the little guy, so adventurous, so capable, but not the wisdom yet climbed into the gas oven. He was okay. But that just shows that we have to put fences sometimes around for the person's protection because that's part of a family as well. Not just free for all all the time. And so, but, if, but fathering and mothering will actually rejoice and celebrate growth. It'll celebrate the person giving it a go. <laughs> In fact, the fathering, here's another thing that you may not, please don't take this wrong. Oftentimes, when a kid's learning to ride a bike, the father will be really, he's not worried if the child falls off, as long as it's not under a car or under a bus, you know what I'm saying, or not, not off the end of a big bank or something. He won't be worried if the, if the child falls off. He will encourage them to get back up again and get going. Sometimes a mother will go, oh, Johnny, did you hurt yourself? Do you need a plaster? <laughs> Are you okay, my boy? Oh, my little boy, my little Johnny. It's his first bite. It's his first. Oh, you're right. I'm, I'm exaggerating. I'm exaggerating. <laughs> Maybe I'm not exaggerating, Mike. Not exaggerating. <laughs> Not at all. All the father's interested in is, hey, get back on. That, that was good ear time. <laughs> you made four feet off that jump. Six feet next time. Just get back on. Because we know that it's about getting out. It's about growing. It's about maturing. It's about taking risk, calculated risk, reasonable risk. You know what I'm saying? Getting out there and actually growing. <laughs> I had a little boat years ago little boat I built when I was about 17 in my apprenticeship. 
had eight feet long, little mini powerboat, had a cockpit, had a deck, had an outboard well, had a little 15-horse Yamaha on it. And Janet, um, we were just not long after we were married, I still had the thing, and Janet's parents were down, uh, we went over to Queenstown, and Janet ended up with kidney stones, she was in hospital, but anyway, she, they knocked her out, so there was no point us being there. And, uh, <laughs> <so> <laughs> But I, ha I had to entertain the parents. So we went to Lake Wakatipu. My brothers and sisters are there with their boats. So because she was asleep. They were just waiting for her to pass the stones. No cell phones then. I couldn't, I couldn't Google. I couldn't. Anyway, they, they sent us away. And, uh, and uh, I'm out on the boat. I'm getting around. For some reason, I was sitting up. I had my hand on the accelerator because my, my throttle wasn't connected and I had my hand on the steering wheel and I wasn't actually secure. I wasn't balanced properly. The little thing had a pretty hard chine, which means it can trip over easily. So I went over my brother's boat wake, tripped on the, uh, it, the boat just tripped on this wake and the little thing just flipped over. And <laughs> the tank fell out, I fell out, you know, and we're bobbing around in the Wakatipu, <laughs> you know, like Wakatipu. <laughs> and after a little while, it's just the peak of the boat sticking out. It was orange. We could see it, because it had a ear in it, you know, and it was plywood, so mostly floated. And <laughs> Janet's father, <laughs> Janet's father's looking at, Wesley just flipped the boat. <laughs> Dad's got his binoculars. Bit of a liability, that boy. <laughs> we, oh, motorbikes and boats, we used to do stuff, and... We got away with it the bulk of the time, you know, we really did. And um, a few broken bones here and there, but, you know. <laughs> but the thing is, I had another, another relative. The dear mother was full of fear. I don't know what happened in her earlier life. Maybe she saw somebody drowning or had a near drowning experience herself. Never got over the trauma. Maybe she is now, but she never got over the trauma back then. And this relative, if they went into the river, it would only be that deep. And the mother would be, oh, oh, don't, 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 don't drown, don't drown. Be, be careful, be careful. The water was only that deep. Fear always tries to minimize our life, make us small. But if we are fearful we'll, we, and we project that onto our sons and daughters, and, and then they get limited by our fear. And if it's unreasonable, unrealistic, and just un and it's not connected to wisdom, then we end up limiting our sons and daughters instead of celebrating their risk and celebrating the fact they've given it a go. They've given it a go. You didn't make the top of the bank still on the bike. You gave it a go. You know what I'm talking about, Peter, don't you? You've given it a go. So we need a house that fundamentally believes in the fundamental value of who we are in Christ with each other, to each other, and then also a, a fathering and mothering dimension that not only is interested in people's safety, but is also in people being adventurous in the spirit and being adventurous in faith and giving it a go. And, and so the miracles that happen at their hands are bigger, than, uh, are more dramatic than the ones that happened at our hands. That, we celebrate that because it's his family and it's family inheritance and it's family increase. And it may be an indication that anointing is increasing because there's something passing on. There's something going to another generation. And as parents, we're not going, oh my goodness, I couldn't do that. I feel insecure. They're going to push me out of the way. They're going to send me to a retirement home. Whatever it is, whatever thoughts arise in people's minds. Because it's based in fear and insecurity. Not in the fathering dimension of the, of the, of the Father of heaven. And as the house of God has revolutionized more and more, to these fundamental values in other places that more advanced. We're still growing in it and exploring it, but I want to tell you this, my friend, the future is exciting and our generations have got great potential when we believe in them. We believe in the righteousness they are in Christ. We believe that they're new creation. Okay, they trip up. Okay, they have a problem with that, but we're going to help them get free of that and we're going to believe in them and we're going to see them go. We're going to see them run. We're going to see them increase because that brings... Expansion to the family. See, nearly finished. We're finishing at one, aren't we? Yep, cool. 
Uh, remember the centurion in uh, Capernaum or Capernaum? Jesus there, disciples, Roman centurion, an Italian guy. <laughs> Could have been Malachi. <laughs> he, he comes out, he meets Jesus on the street. My son is taught, my, my servant is, that's, that's interesting for, for a Roman to have real interest in a servant. That's, that's a cool thing. That's an indicator right there. He's a man of compassion. And, and he values this young man. He's, he's tormented to the, to the point of death. Uh, uh, Jesus, I'll come to your house and heal him. No, 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 I'm not worthy. I'm, he knows he's a Gentile. He knows he's a Jew. He knows what he's thinking. He, he knows that he's not worthy to come into, under his roof. He, he's not worthy to receive this man under his roof. He knows all that. And here's the deal. You speak the word only. Because I am a man under authority. And I say to my men, go and do this, and they do it. I say to my servant, bring me that, and they do it. Speak the word only, I know it shall be done. Well, sure, no, it shall be. Jesus, oh, my, wow. I haven't found such faith even in Israel. What was the deal? This man understood how authority flowed. I think this, this is my, an opinion, one of the key attacks on family is to disconnect children from their fathers and mothers in their emotions and in their trust. To wound the basic trust in the development of a child so it messes up their ability to understand how true authority works. Because understanding how authority works and faith, genuine faith, are inextricably linked. They're connected, very connected. And, and the enemy wants to foster rebellion, rebellion against parents, rebellion against fathers, rebellion against mothers, wants to distort the hearts of parents so that the, the children feel justified in doing so. So there's a breakdown, there's a disconnect, there's a wounding of basic trust. So the whole authority that flows through the household, which is also representative of, representative of the kingdom of God from the father through the household, gets interrupted and distorted and potentially so destroyed that the person needs a major revelation to be able to come back to understand how to trust the father. Because it's an attempt to thwart the development of faith. Because when a person knows they trust their natural father, when the natural father's word is good and, and they back it up with their actions, it's just a natural flow. We, we project that without even thinking about it to our heavenly father. The heavenly father's word is good, just like my natural father. The heavenly father's good. It's natural to believe that his word is going to be true and I'm just going to stand in that. And I'm... Can you see the connection? That's why in the house, in the family of God, fathers and mothers, and I'm speaking to a lot of you here, Please be consistent with the people that you're raising up. Please, please be consistent in your example to them. Please be consistent in your example to them uh, so that they, any distrust in them has a potential to be healed and therefore the connection of faith in the kingdom is going to flow all the more. I don't know if you see that connection, but I do. I, think it's just, I, I see it as a very significant connection. And he stood in that place. He said, Jesus, you're not worthy to come. I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. Speak the word only, and I'm a servant will be healed. Because I have a servant under me. He does this when I say, and because I'm a man under authority. In a healthy family, people learn about how healthy authority flows. And it's easy for them, more easy for them to take their place in the flow of authority. And therefore, the flow of the power of the kingdom flowing through faith, which is confidence that God is true and, 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 and honest and, and faithful and, and fulfill, does what he says, he has the power to do what he says, can raise the dead and so on. That faith, it, it's, it's a flow. 
It's a flow. But the kingdom of darkness has tried to mess with that. So as fathers and mothers, I'm putting the appeal out to you. Your fa fathers and mothers, stand true to the word. Stand true to your conviction. Stand true to your sons and daughters. Back up your words with your action. Don't say something that you're not going to do. I know we can all forget something. You forget to get the milk from the shop or whatever. I'm not saying that. Or you, you, you say, I'm going to call you. Then you get distracted by 10 other things and you forgot to put it in your phone and you haven't called them. You, that's a human thing. I'm talking about what comes out of your heart that is to do with integrity. Fathers and mothers, I'm, t I'm speaking to you. I don't care whether you're 30 or 85. I'm speaking to you. Be consistent in your faith. Be consistent in your example. Stand up. Impart life into another generation. Believe in them. Celebrate them. You don't always understand what the thinking, the motives. The, the, you don't always understand it, but we believe in them. You know what I'm saying? And that's probably about half of what I had to talk about. Probably. And I'm saying that for your relief. <laughs> 1 John 3, Behold what manner of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. The same love that's been bestowed into you has been bestowed into the person next to you. The same blood that purchased you is the person who, is the blood that purchased the person next to you. The same rejoicing that went on in heaven when you came to Christ is the same rejoicing that went on when they came to Christ. The same father who sent his son is the same father as the person sitting next to you. Even the person who's not sitting next to you but annoys you. Why did you laugh? <laughs> Joint ears, that's the big one. That, that was where I was going to major. I haven't done that. Sorry about that. Romans 8, 15 to 17. This whole issue of joint airship is huge. It's really worth exploring. It's really worth meditating on. You see, I'm a joint ear with Janet. We're married, obviously, but we're also joint ears in the spirit. I'm a joint ear with Kimberly. I'm a joint here with Daniel. I'm a joint here with Catherine. I'm a joint here with Megan. I'm a joint here with Johanna. I'm a joint here with Ian. I'm a joint here with Dale. And I could go around all of you who know the Lord. I'm a, I'm a joint ear with you. You're a joint ear with me. I'm not going to mess up your stuff because I'm messing up my stuff. I'm not going to mess up your church because I'm messing up my church. I'm not going to mess up your ministry because I'm messing up my ministry. Hear what I'm saying? We're joint ears. I'm not going to bag you behind your back because I'm bagging somebody who's a joint ear with me. I want to believe in you. I want to see you prosper because that means I'm going to prosper because we're joint ears. Everything that belongs to the kingdom belongs to you. It belongs to me. We, we, it belongs to us together. If we can get that into our spirit, I tell you what, it changes the way we view the whole family. We're joint heirs of all, the, of all of the riches of the kingdom all at the same time because it was all delivered to Jesus. He is the heir of God, the heir of all things, and then we've been made joint heirs with him, co-heirs with him. So we're heirs of all things of the kingdom. That means it's actually our kingdom. It's actually our kingdom. It's your kingdom, it's my kingdom, because we're joint ears with Jesus. If we say it's only Jesus' kingdom, what we're saying is we're not joint ears with him. It's our kingdom. It's our, king, it's our kingdom. That's why we want to extend the kingdom, bless the kingdom, because <laughs> it, it's our kingdom. We're joint ears with him. Why we rejoice in what's happening in Vietnam. Rejoice in what's happening in Australia. They rejoice in what's happening in Zimbabwe. Rejoice what's happening with, with things we do because we're joint ears. We don't get jealous because they saw 1,550 people saved and a bunch of miracles. We don't get jealous of that because they're our people. They're our miracles. They're our inheritance. If you get upset because somebody saw a greater miracle than you, don't get jealous. That just reveals the insecurity. Celebrate because that's your miracle as well. 
You can tell that story if they've got your permission to do it. You can tell that story and bring glory to Jesus because that's part of your inheritance as well. There's been so much jealousy and insecurity in the family of God. It's ridiculous because these fundamental things have not been revealed to perhaps the degree they need to be. Some fathers can't release their sons and can't celebrate their sons going all over the world and doing amazing things because they're insecure. But when they're secure, they celebrate it because it's our fruit. It's our fruit. It's our fruit. Go, boy. Go, girl. Go get him. <laughs> Come and tell us what happened. Come and tell us the miracles. Come and tell us what happened. And tell us the challenges so we can pray for you and get you healed up. Amen? Yeah. See, it's the Spirit in the Father's house. It's, it's, it's more the kingdom. Let's all stand. We started late. <laughs> We're only three minutes past, so that's amazing. That miracle is your miracle too. And they're right here though. <laughs> I believe that there's an anointing that can be imparted. There's an anointing to lift the dimension of fathering and mothering we can walk in. Uh, there's a dimension of the spirit of sonship and daughtership that we can walk in. Some have said you need to become a son before you can become a father. It's true. You become a daughter before you become a mother. I believe there's an, there's an anointing here which can be imparted. It's a fathering anointing. And, I, and I, I don't, I don't, I'm not fully developed in this, obviously. I'm not at all. I'm exploring it and endeavoring to put into practice attitudes and values that, that I'm just becoming convinced about. That's what I'm trying to do. But there's an anointing that goes with that I believe is transferable, and it's for a new day. It's for a new time. So if you're open to it, uh, and if you're hungry to step into something that's more of a fathering, mothering dimension beyond where you're at, and you're believing that there's something can just be received right now. Just just step out, uh, just step out on the front, and and uh, or maybe you know maybe we have to do it where you stand, depending on how many come. But uh, I'm, I don't. Mm. No, I will. Mm. Janet, could you come? Father, we thank you right now. Just thank you for these beautiful people. And uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe this is actually going to be kind of like a power thing. It's, it's something that settles and just permeates. This is, how, this is how I'm feeling this right now. Settles and permeates because we've heard some things that may have stirred us or connected with even things we were thinking and, and, and it's just opened us up more. There's, there's something to settle and permeate into us. So I don't, I don't feel like this is like a power time. You, so I'm not too worried about whether we have catches or not. But if you are getting unstable on your feet, just get on your knees. You know what I'm saying. Just, you just put yourself down on your knees and you can't fall much further than that. I'm serious. Father, we just thank, thank you now. Thank you for what you're doing and releasing in the earth. Thank you that you're filling your house. You're building stones together, living lively stones, into a holy habitation. Which you're filling with your spirit, your presence. Thank you that you're restoring the tabernacle of David place where there was free and open access to the Ark of the Covenant, where people could come and worship and experience the presence of God and the prophetic would flow and that 40-year period under David's kingly rule. And in Acts 15, the apostles understood that there's a rebuilding 
of the tabernacle of David that the Holy Ghost is doing. And that means that also that the Gentiles and the believing Jews would come together and experience the presence of God together. But not only that, that there would be free access. There wouldn't be a curtain that we can't go past. And it says that so the remnant or the remnant of man or the people seeking God can find him. So, Father, I thank you for these beautiful people. Right now, Lord, I thank you for that fathering, mothering dimension of your spirit settling and right just now resting and permeating. Thank you for permeating every life right now that's open to you. Let that anointing shift attitudes that perhaps would hinder the flow of this fathering, mothering anointing in your great family. Thank you, Father, right now. I just feel I'm settling right now. I just feel I'm, it's gentle. It's almost like a Jew. Settling. Could you pray after me? Father, I receive the spirit of fathering. I'm including mothering in that, okay? I receive now. Father, I receive the spirit of sonship, the spirit of being a daughter, the spirit of being a mother, Spirit of being a son, Spirit of being a father, I receive you now. Let the great connect take place. Let the fathers, the mothers, the sons and daughters bond. Let there be the flow of inheritance, the flow of anointing, the flow of understanding the flow of wisdom, the flow of passion, the flow of revelation from fathers to children, from mothers to children. In Jesus' name, fill me. Fill me. Jesus' wonderful, beautiful, precious, outstanding name. Amen and amen.
Amen.